Altera. This PDA has now rebooted in emergency mode with one directive. To keep you alive on an alien world. Hi guys, welcome back to Switch Up. Remember, we give away a free game each and every month to the subscriber most active on the channel. Originally released back in December 2014 through early access and then latter on the Xbox One in 2016, Subnautica would be best described as an open world survival game, however set on an alien planet and under the sea. It was developed and published by Unknown Worlds Entertainment and ran on the Unity engine. I think many of us in the Switch community were interested to find out how it would run on the Switch, as it has been known to have issues across all platforms. Is this a subpar performance? Ouch. Let's find out. Let's begin then with the performance, and this is both a good and bad story. The developers have gone for a locked out 30fps, and for around about 80% of your time it can maintain this. However, as the game progresses, certain aspects of the gameplay will bring the frame rate down. Chief among these is the speed with which you move through the water. When you're slowly doggy paddling your way forward, the game is able to keep up and load the world at a reasonable clip. You will notice quite a bit of pop in and the level of detail draw distance is reasonably close to the player. And when I say reasonably, I mean you can see it growing around you. Is something we've seen used in procedural generation systems in things like No Man's Sky and it means that massive amounts of detail can be put into a game and only the stuff that you need to see is there. However, it is quite close to the player. I didn't find it overly distracting once I got used to it, but it's worth noting that it's there. The visual quality is actually surprisingly good and we'll go into detail in handheld because there's a stark difference between docked and handheld with this game. When docked, the image is reasonable, even stretched over a very large TV. Texture quality takes a hit as you'd imagine, but some of the lighting effects remain, as do arguably the most important things like the specular lighting effect that comes through the water and its surface still undulates pleasingly. The on-screen camera effects remain when you breach and one of the game's most striking aspects, its day-night cycle, remain intact with those bright neon and fluorescent colors of the underwater nighttime scenes doing a good enough job to mask some of the game's visual misgivings. As you progress in the title, you'll gain access to faster vehicles, and this is where the game begins to struggle, as it simply can't keep up with the loading required and some more obvious frame pacing issues will begin to be seen. This results in occasional stutter, short pauses for loading, and when you reach larger underwater areas, that frame rate will come down. It never seems to go below 27 frames per second, but it's the variable frame pacing that makes it quite obvious to the eye. When you hit land, this is only exacerbated, and there's no doubt you'll know you're playing it on a Switch. I think some performance compromises were to be expected, and credit has to go to the developer for the amount of the game that actually runs fine. And as you can see from much of my frame rate capture, it maintained a locked out 30, and the frame pacing was okay, and in those moments, the experience was a real joy. You just need to know going in if you're gonna make the purchase that that's not always the case. As far as visual options and customization go, they've included a couple of things which are nice to see, such as a field of view scale. Now by default, this is quite low, I haven't tampered with it too much as this could potentially introduce more stuttering and frame rate issues as essentially more of the scene is being rendered in front of the camera. But regardless, it is nice that they've included it. And there are options to change the default bindings for every control in the game, which is a nice touch. Let's look now at handheld mode. And this is one of those games where playing in handheld is more preferable than playing in docked. You still experience some of the same frame rate dips, but the image quality to my eye on this smaller screen looks better. It looks more crisp. The frame pacing seems to either be a little masked by the small size or is also slightly optimized for handheld play. And if you are a handheld player, there are a few options in both titles to scale the UI size to help visibility and reading, but in all honesty, just playing on the default size, I had no issues at all. The one area though that this isn't true are on some of the in-game readouts on your tools, but this mainly affects the sequel. One of the standout aspects of Subnautica when it first released is the outstanding soundtrack and audio. This is carried over excellently. Oxygen. 
and artists Corey Strader, Brian Cummings and Scott McDonald will be pleased with how their vision has come across, especially, as I say, in that small handheld experience. The audio doesn't seem to have been downsampled, and with a set of headphones, Subnautica is truly an often terrifying experience, chiefly through that visual and audio synchronicity. Overall then, the visuals and performance are actually better than I thought they would be on the Switch, but that comes with all the caveats I thought there would be on Switch. Frame rates drop in larger areas, there's occasional stutter and dips, but pleasingly the handheld experience was preferable on this title. Visuals and performance score 13 out of 20 and I was really pleased to see how well they've brought across the audio as it's a large component of this game. The cries and groans of a large whale under the ocean that you can then ride on the back of are translated perfectly. Audio scores 18 out of 20. Let's look then at my impressions of story, gameplay and controls and yes, there are many reviews of the title out already, but I never really got to dive into it back in the day, due in part to the birth of my second child. So finally giving it a go as a huge survival game fan has been a real delight. First thing to note, there are four different modes to choose from. You've got survival, freedom, hardcore and creative. Most of these are self-explanatory, bar maybe the freedom mode, which simply removes the hunger and thirst elements of the survival. Your tale begins, as so many have done before, with a crash landing on planet 4546B. I absolutely loved how isolated this makes the player feel. You start and you are literally in an endless ocean, but your ship, the Aurora, suffers a catastrophic failure on entry and sits in the background, a smouldering wreck. There are very few games that have left me feeling quite so alone and helpless as this one. As you plunge beneath the surface, you suddenly realise this is almost like the inversion of every other game. As your head dips beneath the waves, the world opens up. There are caverns and tunnels, crevices to dive down into, and a very limited supply of oxygen initially. As you play through, there are several upgrades that you can acquire, but nothing's handed to the player. Initially, you'll be fumbling around trying to figure out what to do next. But once you've acquired your scanner and began scanning everything in sight, much in the same way as No Man's Sky, new blueprints and other options are opened up. And five hours down the line, you are a survival machine. As with other games, Subnautica is split into underwater biomes, but what I loved here is how these not only act on the horizontal plane, they also act on the vertical. There's a real challenge to diving deep. The pressures increase, it becomes harder to breathe and to maintain and store oxygen, and it also gets really, really dark and gives the player a tangible sense of claustrophobia. There are a couple of niggly design issues that I had with the game, some more clunky crafting aspects, as well as some design choices which are rectified in the sequel, such as trying to remember certain recipes for items, but overall I can fully understand why the game received such critical acclaim at its launch. If you are a survival fan and have, for whatever reason, held off on the game, I can wholeheartedly recommend it. Just be aware of the performance limitations of the Switch, as that will be the stumbling block for most players, and it can feel a little slow and overwhelming, particularly at the start. Gameplay scores 16 out of 20, and it was nice that they'd allowed the player to remap every button of the controls, but when the frame rate drops, the control of the camera is certainly affected. Control score 15 out of 20. Subnautica is going to set you back £24.99 or your regional equivalent, and it does come with a 10% discount until the 13th. And after having a little look around, I can see that it's the exact same price as it is on the Steam store, which I'll accept, that's not bad at all. Usually we see an increase in price on the Switch version, but having said that, if you have a PC that's capable, or any other platform, then those are going to be the way to go in terms of performance. However, on the flip side, the Switch version obviously is the only version that truly has that handheld experience that really shines in this game. There's potentially hundreds of hours of gameplay here. I would like to see a little more done in terms of performance though. Value as it stands, scores 15 out of 20. Uh, this PDA has now rebooted in emergency mode with one directive. To keep you alive. Subnautica is a beautiful and terrifying survival experience that's marred on Nintendo Switch by some performance issues. That being said, the overall switch up score is 77% and as a survival title this is top tier. I've absolutely loved my time with the game. A big thanks to the developer for the review copy and let me know down in the comments if you're interested in this one. Thanks to all the subscribers and all the Patreons, you guys are amazing. 
For all things Switch, all the time, keep it Switch up. Cheers, guys. See ya!